see it everywhere. Record-breaking heat waves in the United States and China. Wildfires ravaging North America and Southern Europe. A fifth year of drought in the Horn of Africa. Together, these snapshots tell an urgent story of what awaits us if we fail to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and begin to climate-proof the world. He forgot to mention the little house fire he had a long time ago. That's El Presidente speaking at the U.N. General Assembly this week on how the world needs to get its act together against climate change. Yeah, that's the biggest issue we face right now. Let's discuss with the host of the Foreign Desk podcast and editor-in-chief of the Foreign Desk, Lisa Daftari. Also with us, senior fellow at the America First Institute, Policy Institute, and Newsmax contributor Fred Flight. So, Fred, we'll start with you. You know, President Biden arrived at the U.N. with his caravan of, what else, gas-guzzling SUVs to lecture us <laughs> and the whole world about the so-called climate crisis. What should his focus have been on? Well, I don't think his focus should have been on climate proofing the world. I, I don't know how one does that. Does that include volcanoes and things that we can't account for? But but look, it, it's really stunning to compare Biden's speech with Netanyahu's speech. Netanyahu spent a long time talking about the growing threat from Iran, how it's a terrorist state, how its nuclear program is advancing. Biden had maybe two sentences. He said, we're not going to let Iran get a nuclear weapon. And then he moved on to climate change. This is not the global leadership we expect from an American president. But we're not going to let them get the weapon, but we're going to give them the money to build the weapon, right? That's uh, right. Lisa, why did leaders from Great Britain, France, China, Russia not even bother to show up? Is, you know, to me, it's like, is the U.N. a relic of the past or is it Biden? Why? Yeah, it appears that way, right? So um, things are shifting. I mean, look, the United States obviously doesn't have the same bite it has, not, not domestically and certainly not in terms of its foreign policy. We used to, for example, punish nations by enforcing sanctions that went along with behavioral changes or requests for behavioral changes on places like Russia, Iran, uh, North Korea. Now all those countries are getting together and they're coming up with their own currency. They're saying, you know what, not only will we trade with each other, we'll sell each other weapons, we'll become more lucrative, and we'll sidestep the United States. That's just a small example of how irrelevant the United States has become. The UN obviously becoming, you know, it, it was symbolic at best in its heyday, and now, of course, diminished much more since then. So Look, everyone wants Ukraine to beat back Russia and win this war. We've given over $113 billion so far. Biden wants another $24 billion. It seems like Congress, you know, they're going to keep writing checks so long as Zelensky keeps his hand out. And, and Zelensky knows how to play his audience, which is Biden, like a fiddle. Watch this. humanity is failing on its climate policy objectives. When islands and countries disappear underwater and when tornadoes and deserts are spreading into, into new territories, we must act united to defeat the aggressor and focus all our capabilities and energy on addressing these challenges. Yeah, so <laughs> Russian bombs are raining down on, on his land, killing his people, but it's climate change. So, Fred, Republicans are, are finally starting to question all of this. Poland may even slow down on sending any more arms. And a leading candidate for prime minister in Slovakia, which is their neighbor, said he would cut off all aid. So my question to you is, with all this money we're giving, what does victory actually look like? And, and what's the end game here for the U.S.? Or are we going to just be there for decades? It really is stunning that Zelensky tries to say that climate change is an existential threat when his country is being occupied by Russia and he's not making any progress in this counteroffensive. At the G20 summit in the U.S. House and in the U.N. General Assembly, uh, people are saying, where's the end game? Where's the ceasefire plan? How do we get out of this war? And that's what happened at the U.N. this week. Most nations weren't impressed by what Biden said, what Zelensky said. They want to see a plan, and they don't want to go with China's plan, because most nations don't trust China. They want to see the fighting stop. Remember what President Trump said a few months ago, I just want to stop the killing. And that's where most nations of the world are. You may not hear this in the mainstream media. You don't hear it from neocons to the Democratic Party. But that is where the U.S. Congress is going. I think Hillary Clinton got it right when she said there's a basket of deplorables. She just got the place wrong. It's actually in the U.N., 
Lisa, uh, the Ukrainian government has a pretty well-deserved reputation for being corrupt. Now, what accountability are we, the taxpayers, getting? You know, our billions upon billions that we're doling out, uh, how do we know it's actually going for the war effort? Most of it, I'm sure, is, but that some of it or, or too much of it is not being skimmed off. Right. We, and we do know that some of it is, is ending up in the wrong places. We had a few investigative pieces at the foreign desk looking into where these uh, weapons are ending up. And of course, taxpayer money, as you said, making it obviously much more of a sensitive issue here at home. But to uh, Fred's point, I think it's, it's wonderful that we're now finally, maybe a little too late, but it's never too late to, to stop corruption. Uh, lawmakers on both sides are saying enough is enough. So it's basically this love language between Zelensky and Biden. And I don't think it's going to go much further where they can, you know, uh, basically um, work around uh, the lawmakers in order to get billions more into Ukraine. Enough is enough. We have so many more problems to deal with. We have our southern border to look at. We have China as a huge issue that no one is even acknowledging. And we just gave $6 billion. We, we allowed frozen assets to go to Iran, where it will put that all back into terrorism, we'll put it into weapons development. It'll sell more weapons to Russia. So we're basically fueling both sides of this war between Russia and Ukraine, allowing for weapons to go from Iran to Russia and also giving billions of dollars into Ukraine. Everyone wants this war to stop. We also want the corruption to stop. Lisa Daftari, Fred Flights, appreciate your time today. Good to be here.